Hi everyone, I'm Alyssa Pillai, and it's my pleasure today to welcome you to the Playbook webinar, The Seven Principles of Lean Project Execution to Increase Communication and Project Velocity. Our speakers today are myself, I am the VP of Marketing at Playbook, David Paulson, our CEO, will be leading the presentation, Greg Katai, our VP of Business Development, will discuss getting started with Playbook and lead us through Q&A, and Eric, our VP of Product Development, is here to support during the Q&A session. In terms of agenda, David's going to cover who we are, what problem we're solving, the seven playbook principles proven to increase communication and project velocity, and then he'll demonstrate playbook, project execution, execution software, and how these principles are supported by the software. As I said earlier, Greg's going to cover getting started with playbook and lead us through Q&A at the end of the session. In terms of housekeeping, please feel free to type your questions into the, into the questions box and Greg and David and Eric will handle them at the end of the webinar. Don't worry if we can't get through all of the questions, because um, we'll definitely answer them by email. And with that, I will hand it over to David. All right, thanks Alyssa. Uh, I would like to start with a little bit of introduction about our background. I want to make it uh, clear that uh, we're not a bunch of software developers that thought we could make a cooler looking project management tool and put it on the web. This solution is the direct result of years of experience solving complex problems in product development. Uh, our experience goes back to the original founders started working together 17 years ago, helping companies uh, implement and improve their engineering processes and tools. And during that time, we worked at companies in pretty much every industry and every company size, and therefore we saw pretty much every um, problem I think that exists in product development. So even though all of these companies were very different, they all had one thing in common. They all wanted to go faster. See, it's, it's no longer a secret that going fast is important for companies in this competitive environment. There uh, was a study that determined that superior product development performance is the number one driver of uh, financial returns over time. There was another study that quantified this, and they found out that if you got 80% of your revenue from new products, you would literally double your market cap every five years. So even though these companies all had the same goal, they also shared the same problem. And that's that 90% of new products are late. And as I mentioned, there's literally hundreds of reasons for this. But there were several studies done recently that kind of boiled the, the major reasons to the top. And so I have a few of them listed here. And the first one is, most companies have too many projects for their available resources. And because of that, it makes it very difficult for the resources themselves, the people, to manage their priorities and know, what should I really be doing today? And therefore, if the people don't know that, um, we have highly inaccurate schedules. And what's interesting, if you really take some time to think of this, um, try to figure out how we got here, it can really be explained by the fact that today's modern project management tools and systems were literally developed over 60 years ago. And they were developed to handle projects that had a lot less complexity and uh, a lot more certainty in terms of what was being done, the types of projects they were managing. So our tools and methods today are, are very antiquated and incapable of handling uh, the special needs, I guess, of product development, project management. So very often, we get approached by people who, um, project managers, resource managers, and people like that, that want to fix this problem, but their company hasn't made a higher level initiative to do so. So I threw in this uh, extra slide to um, help you understand how you can get management's attention. See, the, the language of management in business is money. So this problem has to cost them money in order for them to get interested in solving it. And fortunately, um, it's easy to prove that it does, and the, the costs are very high. So we call this cost of delay, and this term actually came from Don Reinertsen. He's one of our favorite authors on lean product development, and he's written three books. The most recent one is called Product Development Flow, and it is a very good book, full of really good detail and information. 
But for companies that are just getting started, we recommend his second book, Managing the Design Factory. Um, it was actually his first book where he explained how to ca calculate this cost of delay. And I encourage you to ask your team members uh, what they think the impact is to company's profit if you're a month late with your project and see what kind of answers you get. And most people, they think in their head, okay, well, what are we going to sell in a month or the first month and we'll lose that. And they'll end up with a very low answer. But the true cost is much higher. And the reason is, we can explain it with this little graph here. You don't just lose the, the one month of sales that you're late. You're in a competitive market, or unless you're in a monopoly market, you will lose customers while you're not in the marketplace. So first of all, you spend more money on development, and then you start ramping up, and you don't reach the peak sales that you would have had you been earlier. So the total cost of just one month delay is actually the area between these two curves. And that adds up to be uh, quite a big number. In fact, we can teach, we have taught a lot of our customers how to calculate this, and we've been keeping track. And the lowest number we've ever seen was $200,000 of profit, not revenue, but profit for one month delay. Um, it's very often we see it as high as a million dollars a month, and the highest we've ever seen was literally $14 million of lost profit for being a month late. So if we use a nice round number down at the low range, we could say that um, it's pretty typical to lose a half a million dollars in profit just for being a month late. Our customers tell us they're usually between four to 12 months late. So this is costing somewhere between two and six million dollars of profit, and that's per product launch. So imagine how many products does your company launch, uh, launch every year. So anyway, this is a, a big expensive problem, so uh, management should be interested in it, or it should be easy to get their attention. Now the other thing um, these companies have in, pro in common is the, uh, the most of them follow a, um, some type of phase gate product development process. Um, waterfall, phase gate, we like to call this long, linear, and late. So we, we do some things up here, we get the requirements, figure out what we need to do, create the plan and the schedule, start doing it. And then uh, when it gets close to when we think we're going to be done, we start having status meetings because management wants to know what's going on. Is this on time? And usually right before the goal is when these surprises start happening. And companies very often will finish their entire project just doing these two things over and over until they're done. So we realized you know, we, this has to be better. There has to be a better way. So we took um, all that experience we gained at working at all those companies we also started studying lean and agile and theory of constraints. And uh, we went through PDMA's new product development professional certification. We took all of that knowledge and said, what would be a better way to do this? And we came up with this playbook method. And it looks like this. Each bar on this um, graph, each green bar is different. And the blue bar is the same. You still have to do the work. So we don't have enough time to go into this in detail, but a couple things to notice. Um, it's very heavily front-loaded. We do a lot of things in parallel instead of discrete phases. And uh, we always finish on time. In fact, the first time we implemented this, we were at a medical device company. They had a very um, complicated, a fully integrated um, product with all um, disciplines of engineering, electrical, mechanical, software, firmware. The mechanical parts had um, injection molded plastic. Because it was a class three medical device, regulatory and quality were very uh, stringent issues and processes that they had to follow. And they had been in business for 18 years. And during that time, their average product development cycle for making these devices was two and a half years. The best they had ever done was 20 months, so they set a goal to cut that by 10%. So we implemented those playbook methods, and they finished this project in 12 months. They told us later that they usually exceeded their budget by two to 300% on average because of how long it took, and they finished this project 20% under budget. So they literally saved about a half a million dollars just on project budget as well as netted an, at least an additional $3 million by being early 
you know, to their goal. So this is interesting because this um, outcome was, you know, an order of magnitude bigger than anything we had previously gotten, but we didn't know if it was repeatable. So the very next company we went to had a completely different type of project, but we implemented the exact same methods, and they got a, actually a bigger result. So it was at that point we realized, wow, this stuff is repeatable. It does work in environments where there's a lot of uncertainty in a project and a lot of diverse resources doing a lot of different types of work. So we started rolling this out to multiple customers, one at a time, and they always did the same two things. They always hired us back and said, hey, roll this out to the rest of my company, and they and then they asked us for software. They said, wow, it'd be a lot easier if we could uh, automate some of this. So we actually ignored that first question for software because one of the lean principles says keep it simple. But when we um, looked at it or heard it enough times, we decided maybe we should listen to our customer and, and see if we can get them a solution. So we went back to this, uh, this set of methods and we said, what would lend itself to automation? And it turns out it's um, the bottom of the stack fits very nicely in, in a, a software solution. So we ended up calling this the, the execution layer or execution foundation, um, and it replaces a lot of what you see in these manual visual work management systems that companies are using. The top of the stack up here is more uh, strategic at a project level, and then you know this is deciding what to do, and then this is just getting it done. So I want to make a point here that you don't have to change your overall product development process to use this. Most of our companies are and were medical device companies, and they have uh, federally regulated or approved uh, SOPs, development processes, and things like that. And so they literally can't change them or very easily. So this kind of explains how this execution tool can be applied at any phase of the project. And in fact, it works very well in all of the phases. So it's kind of like a, a bolt-on, and it accelerates um, any part of the project um, where you apply it. So now I'm going to go in and, and kind of explain you know, what Playbook does. But first I want to um, show a picture of a, um, a OBEA room or a project war room or something like that. Not um, everybody is using these yet, but they are starting to appear at a lot of companies, especially if they have software teams, because these came from Agile or Scrum. And the idea here is you have a meeting every morning, a short stand-up meeting, and people discuss the tasks that are on these boards, and the tasks are represented by sticky notes. Um, there are a lot of software solutions now for software teams to automate this, and we looked at those carefully, but none of them worked. Uh, for the unique needs of a hardware or other type of um, project management um, teams. So anyway, what was interesting about this is customers love this. They love the visibility that it gave the work. Um, they love the communication that it, it promoted every morning in the meeting. Um, in traditional systems where you have status meetings every two weeks, Half of the information that you're, you're learning about in the status meeting is, is, or the average age of the information is a week old. With these uh, quick, short, daily stand-up meetings, you are finding, uh, learning about important things, blockages and delays and things like that every single day. Um, so, but as well as they worked, they had some unique problems. Um, most companies would have a board for every project. People were on multiple projects. These um, the format of these boards had each resource in a row, and every column was a day, and um, or not a day, a period of time. And so you you couldn't tell by looking at these four sticky notes if there was 14 hours of work or 140 hours of work. Once the, a task got done, it would go in the garbage, and you lost a lot of important history. How long did it take? You know, who did it? Things like that. And um, in this example, the pink tasks are supposed to be critical paths. Looks like you know the whole project is. So as, as well as they work, they certainly had their issues. So we decided, um, let's fix this uh, tool or this method first. 
And because of our experience in product development, we said, let's talk to our customers and find out what exactly they really need this tool to do. So we did our own voice of customer and uh, on 14 different companies. And the first thing they told us, they all pretty much agreed on this, um, they wanted confident end dates for their projects. And that surprised me a little bit. I thought, you know, everybody wanted to go faster, and so we asked them about that, and they said, well, of course we want to go faster, but we, we just don't believe it's possible. We want to just at least start hitting our dates as a first step. So we combined these needs right here. Um, the next one they said, we need to um, really quickly see the impact of changes. And this is one of the major places that traditional PM systems fall down. Product development is a, an environment where changes happen frequently, and they have to. So we need to be able to see that and react to it. Uh, and then they said, we want people to like this. It needs to be sustainable. People need to buy in. It needs to help our culture. So these were the top three. Uh, the rest of these were on the list very often. So. Um, but they kind of, each one of these actually drives the top three, so I indented them. You know, if we had better communication, you know, we would know what happens when changes occur. Um, we would have more confident end dates. Clear priorities, is clear and correct priorities are really important in order, you know, to hit your end dates. Multitasking, uh, a lot of people want to re reduce that, and people are recognizing that that is a bad thing now. Um, but it's really just a symptom of not having clear priorities and um, seeing resource loading. So anyway, we said, okay, what can we do, taking everything we know from Lean and Agile and TOC, what, can, what principles can we bring to bear to meet these needs? And we came up with this list right here. Um, I'll explain each one of these in a minute, but I wanted to show you the, this list first and then show you how they are impacted by um, how they each impact the needs that the customers told us they had. So this is a um, very busy chart, I'll just, um, but it shows how each principle impacts each one of those needs. And I'll go through each one of these one at a time here. It's really important um, when we're demoing the software that customers understand what these principles are because the software seems fairly simple uh, on a, at a surface level, but if you don't understand um, these principles and why they work, you won't understand why it is so powerful or it gets the results that it does. So this first one is decentralized rolling wave planning and task ownership. So this first word, decentralized, is, is key here. We believe that the team members, the people that are doing the work, are the best people to organize and plan it. They know what needs to be done, when, the dependencies, the sequences, and also how long it'll probably take. The problem is, the reason uh, people don't do that is that today's existing tools make it very difficult for team members to do any sort of planning. They're too complicated or they can't access them or something like that. Um, so we knew our, our tool had to allow for decentralized planning. The rolling wave portion comes from uh, Agile or Scrum, and it says don't plan your project out 18 months from now in high-level detail. A lot of things might change. You know, who knows what's going to happen. Instead, plan a fairly high-level detail in the next week or two or three or four or the sprint. Have that in the correct amount of detail, and then update that every week or two on some uh, specific cadence. And as long as you have the work organized that's right in front of you, you're doing the best you can. So our tool, and you'll see this, is, um, enables decentralized planning where the um, uh, project manager creates the outline at the high level, and then the team members themselves create the necessary detail at the low level. The next principle is around shared buffers. And I really like this one. It came from Theory of Constraints, uh, Critical Chain Project Management. And uh, this says that um, people, th there's a problem with asking uh, resources for how long things take. What happens is if you're a good project manager and instead of um, you deciding or guessing how long something's going to take, if you actually ask the team members, uh, you won't get their true answers. And the reason is if, if you ask me how long it would take to do something, I thought I could do it in five days, 
I would buffer my answer and probably tell you 10 because I know I'll get interrupted. I know something will happen that I, I didn't plan. I got a lot of other things going on. Um, I think I can do it in five, but I don't want to be late, so I'm going to tell you 10. Well, if you ask three people that question and they all give the same answer, you'll end up with a 30-day project plan that literally has about 15 days of work in it. And uh, Critical Chain points out this concept called student syndrome that says people don't work on something until right before it's due. It's not that they're lazy. It means early on they're doing other things. They're out here multitasking or whatever, and they'll get to this you know, when it's a, a big fire or, or fairly urgent. Well, if you combine that with Parkinson's law, which says work fills up to take the amount of time allotted, these, those two principles will actually make this 30-day plan that's already the, the longest it could possibly be, it'll actually take longer. So what we teach people is um, teach your resources to give 50-50 estimates. If you think you can put in five, say that. And in exchange, well, so a couple things. We'll take all those tasks. And instead of adding you know, the sum of these other buffers, we'll look at how many tasks got estimated, what's the uncertainty or the risk in the task, and then we'll come up with an appropriately sized buffer. Now, in exchange for that to your resources, when, you, when they start working on this task, you have to promise not to make them multitask, let them focus and get it done. And we do expect that you will use up some of this buffer, so usually not all of this. So here, you get a more realistic and aggressive project plan. And this has a lot of you know, psychological influence on people not wanting to be late and use the team's buffer. So anyway, you'll see this in the, in the software where I demonstrate it. This next principle is also very important. And this is about reprioritizing around the critical chain or critical path. And the reason is, in traditional systems, most project plans will tell us, here's the critical path. These people you know, need to be helped, or we need to make sure this part of the project goes quickly. But because changes happen so frequently in product development, it's very possible that the day after you create your plan, something changed and the critical path jumped. You might not notice for two weeks until you re-update the schedule. And you, so you may spend two weeks um, expediting things that aren't important and ignoring things that are. So a system, in order for us to have clear and correct priorities every day, it needs to tell us in real time where the critical path is and who's on it. So I'll um, make sure I highlight that in the demonstration as well. This fourth principle about uh, short, frequent stand-up meetings is um, very useful. This came from Scrum again. The, um, and I mentioned this a little bit. It's better. In, um, our customers used to tell us, we have too many meetings. And we would say, no, actually, you don't have too many. You have ineffective ones. It would be better if you broke that, that big batch biweekly status meeting down into little 15-minute meetings that happened every day. And then you could discuss, you know, everything you were discussing was only a, a day old. So it's really quickly, as quickly as possible, uncovers blockages and issues and things like that. What really is the key to these meetings, though, is the board you're looking at when you're having it. Because the board is, is the picture. And the picture is worth a 1,000 words or maybe more. And once you understand uh, what this information means, this meeting can be very productive and effective. In fact, we have customers that have um, 15 or more people in some of their meetings. And they regularly execute them in less than 10 minutes. So this next um, principle is pull. And this is a, a basic foundational lean principle. We used to um, plan and schedule everything. We said, here's the plan. Stick to it. Don't deviate. Uh, but we learned that doesn't work. Manufacturing and lean and Toyota taught us it's better to pull tasks when you're ready. Give a resource, a machine, a person, or whatever some work to do. Let them finish it. And when they're done, go back to a backlog or a Kanban card or something like that, grab your next uh, task after it's been, your backlog has been reprioritized. If everybody did this every day throughout the year, at the end of the year, you could look back and say, wow, 
everybody for the entire year worked on the most important task they could have every single day. And the definition of most important is determined by um, a lot of things, including the, the schedule, the work, um, changing priorities, and things like that. But everybody on the team sees it, and they, you know, there's always a consensus that everybody's doing what they should be. So our system, I'll show you, has its prioritized backlog, and people pull from it and put tasks on their, their daily board. Um, this next topic is visible cues, and this is interesting because a, a cue is the work that's in your inbox that is actually actionable. People in their mind, they, they're holding 100 tasks in their mind and say, oh my goodness, I have to do all this. But really, out of 100 tasks, maybe only 5 or 10 of them are, are literally queued up where you could start and finish the work. The rest of them have dependencies that are, you know, are going to happen later in the plan. Um, the value of being able to see these cues pile up is a cue is the leading most indicator of schedule slippages. So we can look at our plan and all the work and the loading and things like that, but it's when the cue starts forming on a resource, that's the indicator that that resource is, is being overloaded and their work is going to slow down or be late. So a, a system can actually predict schedule slides before they happen. So I'll show you how to see that as well. And now this last principle is about um, managed loading. Every lean system says you have to manage your WIP. Um, of course, we agree with that. The reason is the impact of cycle time on capacity utilization of the system. Um, that's represented by this graph. Um, every manufacturing engineer knows that you don't plan, you don't load manufacturing beyond 80% because things will happen, even in the low variability system that manufacturing is, things will happen and they'll need spare time or spare capacity to catch back up and stay on plan. But if you go upstream in R&D and you say, how busy are the resources here? Project managers and even senior managers say, oh, we have everyone booked to 40, 44, 50 hours, whatever. And then they, but they don't understand the, the detrimental impact to cycle time of an overloaded system. So the um, any work management system has to show this. And another closely related concept is, is about availability. Most of our customers have people working on multiple projects. So they're only available to any given project a few hours a day. Well, if you look at the duration of a task, it's related to the amount of work in the task divided by the availability. So if I have a 12-hour task and I work on it two hours a day, it'll take me six days. Well, guess what happens if your availability drops by only one hour? This curve right here is um, showing the relationship of duration to my availability, and this is the curve for a 12-hour task. If I work on it two hours a day, I'll get it done in six days. But if my availability drops only one hour for a short period of time, my cycle time or the duration of my task instantly doubled from 6 to 12 hours. So if you don't understand that, it, it's hard to see uh, the impact of availability. So our system, of course, shows you, you know, true availability, you know, looking out over the long-term horizon and even daily itself. So anyway, those are the um, seven principles in a fairly high level of detail, and I, I hope you learned something and um, can better understand how this software works. What I'll do here is um, show you the demo now of the software. I just opened up, um, I had an Internet Explorer open and I had already logged in. Our system is hosted in the cloud. You can bring it on premise if you need to, but right now each uh, customer gets their own um, website. and. Um, I'm going to maximize the screen here. So once you're logged in, the first order of um, context, I guess, is to get to the right project. And so we have a list here. There's just a few in our demo system. We have customers with uh, uh, probably up to 20 large projects already. Um, and once you're in the right project, the rest of the software is um, represented in these four tabs. It's a very simple application. It's, it's all in these tabs. So I'm going to explain the huddle view first. 
this is where the team has their stand-up meeting. And um, in this format, I have each resource is on a row, and every column is a day, and the green bar represents today. So each task you see right here is the work that each resource owes this team for this project for today. Very simple. The um, Most of our customers have people on multiple projects, so we have the My Playbook view. And in this format, it's very similar. Every column is still a, a separate day. Um, but now, instead of each row being a resource, this whole entire view is for a single resource. So this is Mary, and she's on three projects. And this is the task that she owes each project team for today. Now, these tasks, they're not just um, random sticky notes that, that came from somewhere. These are actually driven by work in the plan. And this plan is um, done over here on the, the game plan tab. And this um, is a simple, lightweight planning tool. I have my months, my time frame across the top. I can see my days. Um, each dark bar is a, a weekend, so you can kind of see the time frame. These long, horizontal gray bars are called summary tasks. And this is where the project manager can set up the overall project structure. So these summary tasks can represent your phases and gates. They can represent uh, systems that you're building or subsystems. They can even represent individual components. Or you could set this up using any combination of everything I just said. But once you have this overall structure developed, you turn the tool over to the team members, and then they do the little decentralized mini project planning in each one of these summary tasks. So each summary task gets an owner, and they're responsible for making sure that the task, you know, their little mini project um, is developed and up to date. So I just opened three of them at the bottom. And the first thing you might notice is the colors. So the pink ones represent the critical path. So any delay on this sequence of the tasks is going to take longer. The orange tasks have between one and four days of slack, and the yellow tasks have um, five day, or one and five days of slack is the orange, and the yellow tasks have more than five days of slack, and that's actually configurable. Um, each one of these summary tasks we have ending with a um, black diamond. This is a uh, intermediate milestone, and then these feed down here into a um, major milestone represented by this green diamond, and this one's important because this is what drives the criticality back upstream and determines our critical path. Now, I mentioned that um, these tasks are people's 50-50 estimates. So these are unbuffered themselves. And we have the entire um, intermediate project buffer down here. So we have a, um, quite a few. I didn't show them all. But we have a number of little mini projects that have to happen, and the longest of which is about eight weeks. So we've sized a 12-day buffer. Notice down here I have another phase of my project starting, that's um, time to start at the end of this buffer. So any changes you see to the project um, schedule and plan right here don't impact my overall end date um, because they're, they're buffered, they're kept separate. If, of course, if I do blow through this buffer and my milestone ends up out here, then we'll have to talk about what's happening to the overall schedule. But this tool is um, very uh, intuitive, graphical, and flexible. Um, each resource can um, make changes to their part of it when they need to. In this example, um, Bob might find out that he can't work on this tomorrow. And by the way, the, the green bar is today again, of course. So um, if Bob finds out he can't work on this tomorrow, he can just grab the task and move it to the right. He's going to be sick or called out or whatever. Well, of course, when he did that, we see that, oh, that change just ate two days of my buffer. Um, but this is drag and drop. You just grab a task to resort it, whatever. These are, you know, really easy to organize and uh, make look nice. But the real power now of this plan is how it interacts with the huddle. So going back to here, these team members are having their stand-up meeting, and this is the work that's on their plate. And this work I mentioned wasn't just random. It actually interacts directly with what's in the plan. So I just opened up a view down here, 
And um, if I click on Bob's task here, it highlights down here in the plan. So I can see, oh, this is a two-day task. He started it yesterday. He'll be done today. I can click on John's task, and I can see, oh, this got completed yesterday, so he's doing that, then that's going to happen. So everybody knows the context of the work they're working on, where it came from, and what happens next. But watch what happens if Bob works on this for two days and he realizes he can't finish it. All he has to do, he doesn't have to tell the project manager or anything, he just right clicks on the task and says add segment. As soon as I click this, watch what happens down here in the plan. First of all, he got a, another segment for tomorrow for this task and it updated the plan. Something that happened in real life was uh, instantly updated in our plan. If I scroll down here, I could see that, yeah, we ate a day on the buffer, so Bob would know that, okay, that's not a good thing. Maybe what might have happened is he planned this for three days, and he realized, if I were, I'm on the critical path. If I work really hard and get this done a day early, I'll save a day on my project. In that case, he just right-clicks on this and says remove segment, and now he's saved a day on the buffer. So this um, tool, besides updating the plan, it also allows the team members in their daily meetings to see, is there anything I can do um, to, to speed up the project or keep it slipping? There's a saying, um, how does a 12-month project become two months late? Well, the answer is one day at a time. In fact, if you do the simple math, if, you, if your project slides just one day a week, a 12-month project will end up being uh, two months late by the time it's done. So, Anyway, um, one example of how they could do that is um, by deciding, you know, what their priorities are for that day. In this example, by the way, we're seeing the tasks that are on today on the green bar. These are scheduled, so they're on um, people's plate for that day. Notice in the future, they haven't scheduled tasks on their day. That's because they exist back here in the backlog. These tasks right here, I can click on them, and they'll highlight in the project, these are all the tasks that are in the future, and they're in the plan state with a dotted line around them. So these people, um, at any time, they can look in their backlog and say, what could we do to uh, speed up the project? In this example, they might realize that Sue's task has quite a bit of slack in it. I could turn it on and show the slack. She has eight days of slack. If she could help Bob with this task, they might get it done a day early. So they could, in the daily meeting, decide to give this task to Sue instead. And as soon as they do, um, it pulled in the project by a day and reassigned it to Sue. So you see how every morning the team can make decisions um, how to keep the project on track and who the critical resource is. So um, the other thing that happens a lot is, is changes. And in, in um, this example, I had a task down here that was longer than the rest of them. Um, this represents the lead time on ordering a part. In a traditional system, or so when we created this, team created this part of the plan, they just guessed that this was going to be 20 days. Now that the project started, they could say, um, Ken could call the vendor and say, hey, can I get a lead time quote on this? And when he gets that answer back, um, in a traditional system, it's very hard for him to um, know if that uh, answer is important or who to tell. So let's say he called the vendor and the vendor said, hey, I can finish this in 13 days. So again, in a traditional system, he could wait till the status meeting, he could mention it there. You know, who would have heard it? Uh, does it ma matter? Is that important information? Maybe Ken suspects it is, so he said, oh, I better let everybody know. So he sends an email to the whole team and says, hey, the lead time's 13 days. But still, what impact does that have? In Playbook, all he has to do is grab the end of this task, and I'm going to drag this in and let go of it. But before I do, I want you to look back here at people's um, prioritized backlog and the priorities that are on their plate. So when we get this um, bit of information and he changes the duration of this task to 13 days and lets go of it, first thing that happened is, we, re we see that the critical path actually jumped. So now it's the team or the components up here that are on the critical path and need to be expedited. And we are notified as well. But also our backlog, our prioritized backlog 
changed instantly because we have different priorities. So this allows us, or this ensures that every day when we pull a task out of our backlog, we truly have the, the most important thing that we could be working on. I guess if I tried to make this demo only five minutes long or if I wanted you to remember just one thing, I would say this is it. Playbook ensures that everybody on the team has clear and correct priorities uh, every day in real time. So a couple other um, things to point out is um, I mentioned capacity loading. This dot you see here tells um, how much of your day is filled up by the work on your plate. So the tasks don't only know how many days long they are, they know how much work is in them. So if Bob pulls this task out, drops it on today, it took up half of his day because it has four hours of work in it. All I have to do to change that is I grab the bottom and drag it down. As soon as I go over 50% of my day, it turns yellow, and then at 75, it turns red. And if you go over eight, it actually explodes, kind of to warn you that uh, this is too much work you're at a high risk for not getting that done. The reason we do this is um, the, the plans can't be accurate out into the future if they're not accurate for even today. So if Bob had this, these two tasks on his day, the team could call him out and say, Bob, do you really plan on getting that much work done today? You know, thanks for working hard. You're, you're going to help us save time on the project, but is that really realistic? Um, and then the last thing to point out in this view is when you complete a task, or this black dot is what we call the Q dot. I mentioned one of the key principles is visible or actionable cues. What work in this backlog um, could actually be started now if the resources had time? It's pretty easy to see down here in the plan what dependencies are, and you know I know I can't do this until that's done. But in our backlog, we don't notice that. So we put this Q dot on here. So when Bob marks this complete, this Q dot will jump back here and tell him what tasks in his backlog could actually be started. So I'll do that. I'll right click and say mark complete. This gets hatched out and it records exactly what happened and when. The Q dot jumped over here and it reprioritized my backlog. Notice I have a, a lower priority task, something with 14 days of slack, that's queued up in my backlog. That task is down here. Even though there's um, critical path items below it, those aren't ready to be worked on. So this is literally the, the actionable work in Bob's backlog. And if you see a resource with 10 or 15 tasks that are queued up, you know that resource is falling behind. OK, so um, that's the uh, daily meeting board. As I mentioned, um, there's so much information on this screen. Once you know how to read it, Teams with 15 people can easily have meetings in, in less than 10 minutes. But what happens you know, after the daily meeting, and that's what I want to demonstrate here. This, is, uh, this part of the demo shows exactly how much uh, work each person or how much interaction each person has with the system to keep it up to date and running. So in this example, um, Mary has these three projects. She may or may not go to one or two or three daily meetings. Um, they don't have to happen every day. They can be staggered. And with this tool, she can even self-select and decide which meetings she needs to attend or not. But in any case, um, when she gets back to her desk, she doesn't have to remember anything she committed to because it's right here. So in this case, this is her most important project. And this is the task that's on her plate. So of course, she does this first. She can resize it if you want accurate data. Just have the people resize the task and then mark it complete. After she's done that, her next uh, task for the rest of the day is down here. So she works on this for a little while. She resizes it, and then she marks it complete. Now she had a good day. She actually got her work done. And uh, so she can go back to her backlog and decide, what else could I do today that will help me stay ahead? Well, here's her queued up task. She decides to work on this one, so she pulls it out. She works on it for a while until it's time to go home. And uh, she didn't finish it, so she adds a segment for tomorrow. And now she thinks she can finish this work tomorrow in about two hours since she's already had a head start on it. 
So now you can click these boxes to close out your day. This just indicates that it, this information is up to date. It also puts a, a soft lock on it so nobody accidentally changes it. You can click this box to close out all your projects at the same time. Now the last thing for her to do before she goes home is look at tomorrow because these are the promises she's making these various teams in terms of the work that she's going to get done. She notices she's way overloaded and then she remembers this task has been scheduled to start on Friday um, and so it's going to take all day. She realizes she doesn't have time or doesn't want to do it. So all she has to do is go back to the um, look at the other resources that are available and find someone who has the, the skill and the availability to do this work and she can just grab this task and hand it off to Sue. Now Sue will get a notification that she has a task that she hasn't seen before or accepted. I like to tell people if you're going to give someone that much work you should probably call them in advance and discuss it. But in any case that's all she has to do. So now her day she has six hours of planned work. She'll be lucky if she gets both of these done tomorrow, so this is a good place to stop. Now all she has to do is hit save and go home. So the all of the work I did here took about two minutes, and that's exactly what we expect each resource to um, do in the system every day to keep it up to date and running. The only uh, exception is, or the only additional thing is, go back to your game plan and the summary task owners every week or two, depending on how quickly things are changing, Look at these plans and say, are they still relevant? Are they up to date? Do I need to make any changes? Should I add detail out here or whatever? So if you do those two things, this entire system will stay up to date and running, and uh, people will constantly have their clear and correct priorities every day. So um, that's it for the uh, major part of the demo. I want to finish up so we can get to Q&A. So I'll switch back here to the slides. And um, by the way, when we implement this, we uh, survey our users before and after, find out what their issues and expectations are. And uh, we've collected a, a, a bunch of um, quotes that we very often hear. People love the communication that this provides because of the visibility of the work. Um, teams become empowered. In traditional systems, when people don't know what's going on, we put these uh, control mechanisms in to, to make sure projects stay on schedule. But we found if you, you can turn that paradigm upside down, and the team becomes empowered when everyone has visibility to what's going on. Um, the uh, project managers are freed up to do strategic planning, and, and many of them even quit using uh, their other project tools. So with that, I'll. Um, turn this over to Greg and um, he'll explain how we ramp people up and get them um, using the software effectively very quickly. Greg, are you there? Yes. You? Hi, everybody. Uh, so this is Greg Katai and uh, just quickly want to tell you a little bit about what implementation would look like. Um, so we have a three-week project that we've put together that makes this very rapid to implement. And um, as you saw from the software, it's really uh, fairly straightforward to learn to use the software. So really, most of this three-week process is teaching people the behavior changes that really allow you to get faster projects. So those seven principal concepts that we talked about today. So uh, in three weeks, essentially what we're doing is we're teaching you the principles in the first week. It's really in the first day. And we're also teaching you how to use the software. Uh, by the second day, we're building out your project plans and actually in workshop mode really helping to build out the project schedule with the near-term milestones so that, that kind of that granular view of the project going out maybe two to four weeks. We're continuing that in the first week, but we're also starting to get productive work out of the system generally by the third day. And so your team is now going to be using the software. You'll see your project plans. You'll be updating your days and we'll be starting to do very rapid, efficient stand-up meetings with us as a coach. And so uh, essentially think of it as a, a mini lean transformation that we're applying to the product development organization um, that can be done very quickly. Uh, the first week is then on-site typically, and then weeks two and three, we generally support you remotely 
and it really starts to taper off very quickly. Um, so the heavy lifting is in the first week, and after that, it's more of a, a remote support role to just help to reinforce the behavioral changes that really give you the results you're looking for, um, but also to just provide general support on the software. So uh, that's really all it takes. Um, we've done this a number of times now, and it's working pretty well. Right. David, next slide. So we have Q&A now, um, and thanks for, uh, thanks for hanging out with us here for the last uh, 50 minutes or so. I um, want to open it up for questions. If you can type in your questions into the, uh, into the window, we'll take those and uh, we'll, we'll get them answered. So we'll give you a minute or two here to, uh, to ask some questions. So the first question that we have uh, is whether or not we can import Microsoft Project schedules. Um, Eric, are you there? Do you want to answer that? Uh, yes, I'm here. Um, so the answer to that is yes, we can uh, through the back door. There's not a front door uh, import function, but we can definitely get you up to speed very quickly by importing your current projects. So, oh, there's some limitations to that, but uh, not probably ones that are going to impact you too much. Okay. Let's see, any other questions coming in right now? I can add that that question is, is very often the first question we're asked. Um, the um, What teams very often find out when they see how simple it is to plan and they look at their current project plan versus uh, what it would be like if, if they had the team help. Sometimes they say there's an, enough differences that um, they just do the planning right from playbook. And since multiple team members can all plan at the same time, you can actually build that, that first three or four week plan in a few hours um, with your teammates. Another question that uh, has come in is, uh, can you use this system for software? or is this really geared for hardware development? So I'll, I'll answer that. Um, you could, and we do have uh, one customer that is using it for software projects, but we didn't specifically design it for software teams. Those tools already existed when we built this, and the needs for uh, software teams are, are quite a bit different. They can do sprints. They have homogenous teams, the dependencies aren't important, they don't have lead times and things like that. Um, so you could, but that wasn't our target. What people usually do is if they have software teams, they'll continue to use their application. And then in Playbook, they, re they add a resource for the software and um, they can track when those releases or those sprints are uh, and time those with integration points in, in, the pro other, in our project plan. Okay, another question is uh, related to this distributed or uh, uh, d distributed planning. Uh, and essentially what it's asking is project managers are typically the ones in the organization that manage a project. So how well does it really work uh, to distribute the planning out? The, uh, our experience is the project managers that start using this really like it. Um, in traditional systems that they, they may create that plan and I don't know if they're um, actually asking the, the team members for estimates and things like that, but they find out that they spend a lot of time getting um, updates before status meetings and then making changes you know, long after they've happened to make the schedule reflect real life. By turning, um, by allowing the decentralized planning, the project manager can still own the overall structure and the milestones and the dates and things like that that are important, um, but the team members can mess with details and do the updating uh, that keeps the, the plan accurate you know, 24 and 7. So uh, every project manager that's uh, started using this has really liked the change uh, in their role from less of an admin to more of a strategic uh, planning person. All right, thanks, David. Um, so I've got another question here, and um, I think I understand the question is, how does Playbook manage planned redo effort during the fix part of a design-build-test-fix cycle? 
Yeah, how yes. to manage the planned redo effort. Let me take that one. Sure. Um, so, you know, it's just like really anything else. If you can foresee it, if there's a chance of it happening, um, you know, it's better to put a task in there to bring visibility to that and uh, remove it if you don't need it than it is to pretend like it's not going to happen and have you be delayed because of it. Um, so we put that in as task. If there's a fix. There, if there are often fixes to be made, then we've got to make sure we include that in. One of the great benefits of the tool is you get to see how many, how often that's happened in the past, and use that to and carry that forward into the future with realistic expectations about how long it's, how many times it's going to happen in the future. Eric, uh, as a follow-up to that, um, that's where buffers really come into play as well, right? That if you yeah. if you know from historically that you've got a significant amount of of uh, fix work or redo work then you should be able to understand that there's risk and therefore that would increase the size of the buffer to accommodate that kind of a cycle, correct? Yeah, one of the, one of the um, factors that you use to size a buffer is how certain are you in the plan, in the, the work that you have laid out in front of you, that that's going to be sufficient. And if there's fixed tasks that aren't laid out there, then but you know they're there, then the buffer is the place to put them if you're not going to put them into a task. They're not going to the just other, go away. So. The other thing I'll add to that uncertainty is we have a pharmaceutical customer that they do tests, and the outcome of those tests um, trigger work that varies a lot between eight hours and 56 hours. So they put in tasks with a note, you know, large, medium, or small investigation, and they have three of these in a row because it has to go through that loop. And so as soon as they find out the results of the test, someone drags the length of that task and say, oh, no, this is the 56-hour one or this is the 8-hour one. But it's real easy for the resource to make that, share that information instantly and see the impact of the, the rest of this project. Okay. So, uh, David, do you want to uh, scroll to the, uh, the last slide? And I think we're going to wrap it up. Uh, no more questions have come in. So um, if you've got any other ones, we'll give you another uh, five seconds. And uh, otherwise, we will uh, call it a wrap. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, on the screen, you can see how to reach me uh, and, and get a hold of us through, via our website. And we'll also have the webinar available uh, as a replay. Thanks very much for your time today. Very much appreciate it.